My name is Abby Wolf, and I'm the Vice President and Director of the Center for Critical Mineral Strategy at SAFE. SAFE is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, mission driven organization dedicated to securing supply chains for transportation, energy, and defense in ways that support US and allied security and economic competitiveness. Today, we'll attempt to delve into the differences um, and among and reasoning behind some of the many lists that help shape U.S. policy around critical minerals and materials. While the title of today's event is lighthearted, the issue surrounding which minerals and materials are ultimately deemed critical is anything but. For many in the industry, these lists represent the best chance their projects have at securing funding and getting off the ground whether through preferential access to government grants, loans, and tax incentives, or as a high sign to private equity, proving that their project is indeed worthwhile. In the United States and elsewhere, it is already an uphill battle to develop new deposits for minerals and metals that would help to make us more secure and to meet goals to electrify and reindustrialize. Aside from high capital expenditure costs, environmental impacts, and meaningful concerns from local and indigenous communities, opaque and volatile supply chains also stack the odds against new projects and deter investment. While these concerns should not be ignored, we must also recognize the need to create an environment that allows for the sustainable development of these important reserves that insulates us from dependence upon strategic competitors. The minerals and materials that comprise these lists form the basis of some of our most cutting edge technologies. Things like neodymium, nickel, and copper underpin everything from the Ford F-150E Lightning to the F-35 fighter jet. Commodities like lithium and graphite are expected to see exponential increases in demand in the coming decade to fuel the growth in batteries. And without germanium and gallium, two elements that have recently gained widespread attention due to China's decision to potentially restrict exports to the United States, you would not be able to tune into this webinar today. The United States is not alone in its quest to determine which minerals and materials are the most important to ensure its key sectors keep humming. The European Commission and countries like Canada and Australia have also released various lists that detail which elements are key constituents in essential technical, industrial, and agricultural areas and are vulnerable to supply disruption. And many are vulnerable to supply disruption. Current mineral and material supply chains are highly concentrated in a handful of countries, most notably China. In addition to strategically purchasing or partnering to secure access to global reserves of key commodities around the world, China has also cornered the market on minerals processing, or the key steps needed to transform a raw mineral into a usable compound or good. And the Chinese government has not been shy about its ability to leverage its mineral dominance for geopolitical gain. Do the critical minerals and materials lists as they stand today actually help reduce our vulnerability? Does it hurt, hurt or help us to have multiple lists with dozens of minerals? And is anything truly critical if everything is? Should lists be responsible for gauging future demand and be forward-looking? Or should they simply present the outlook for dependence as it exists today? Today, we'll hear from experts behind the lists at the Department of the Interior, Department of Energy and Department of Defense to untangle how their respective lists came to be, what their criteria are, and how they are used. Please note, we will be taking audience questions toward the end, so please have your questions ready and put them in the Q&A box. While we may not be able to address all of the questions in the time allotted, please feel free to reach out to us following the webinar for more information. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, our first speaker will be Stephen Fortier, Director of the National Minerals Information Center at the U.S. Geological Survey and one of the many experts behind the Department of the Interior's Critical Minerals List. Stephen came to government after nearly two decades in the mining and mineral processing industry where he held a succession of roles including technical, project management, operations director, and general management positions. Stephen also has previously served as Senior Policy Advisor for the Office of Science and Technology Policy and Co-Chair of the National Science and Technology Subcommittee on Critical Minerals. Thank you for joining us today, Stephen. Thank you, Abby. I'm happy to be here. Um, the, uh, if we can get the slides up, um, I will start a brief presentation. Here we go. Yeah, the USGS has been uh, leading the interagency effort to develop 
critical minerals screening methodology for about 10 years now. The USGS critical minerals list, which we produce on behalf of the Department of the Interior, is a derivative product from this methodology. I'm gonna walk quickly through some of the high points of that methodology today for those of you who may not be familiar with it because it does form the basis for everything that we do. We take a pretty um, standard approach to uh, um, risk analysis where we define a supply risk as a function of a hazard, an exposure to a hazard, and then a vulnerability arising from that exposure to the hazard. Um, the um, components of this, which we endeavor to quantify, and we are a science agency, and so we prefer to take a, a quantitative approach to these issues uh, and, and quantitative definition of for what constitutes a critical mineral, um, consists of these components um, that measure supply risk and exposure to, to, to trade, um, uh, net import reliance, and then the economic vulnerability expressed as, as, uh, in, as a percentage of um, a company's costs uh, that are made up by their raw materials. So um, it is a quantitative approach. We can't do this for everything, but for everything that we can evaluate quantitatively, we um, collect, uh, consolidate, and, and use this data to inform the um, analysis of supply chain disruption risk that allows us to define what the critical mineral list should look like. Um, here is an example of the output uh, that was published in a, a um, report that we issued that we are required to uh, report um, by Congress uh, when we issue a revision of the critical minerals list that shows a heat map of um, uh, the trend analysis for the supply chain disruption metric over a period of several years. And you can see as the colors get warmer, um, it, it indicates a, an increase in the supply chain disruption risk metric, the overall metric that is made up by those individual components. And I would just like to point out for those who have criticized us in the past, and we have been criticized, let's go through the territory, um, that we are not forward looking, that there is some predictive value in looking at this as trends in the factors that make up the components of uh, supply chain uh, risk. Um, you can see very clearly the top entry here is gallium and a clear increase in the supply chain disruption risk as measured by our method uh, with warming colors. And it was the single highest supply chain risk metric commodity that we analyzed in the last cycle. And as I'm sure you're all aware, the Chinese have just announced export controls on gallium and germanium in recognition of the importance of those elements for semiconductor and optoelectronic applications. So, you know, we could see this coming in our data. Uh, there are other examples of this. Um, and, and really that is the reason this methodology was developed. It is data-based, it is fact-based, and it is quantitative to the extent that we are able to do that where we have data. And looking at trends gives us some insight into how the industry is developing and whether we have factors like increasing concentration of production or increasing net import reliance that could indicate that we have a problem coming. Um, so um, a list sort of infers that you have some kind of cutoff um, that will determine where what's on the list and what isn't. Um, and so we have one that is statistically defined. Um, it, it is uh, at a, a particular point in the zero to one normalized scale that depends on the factors that make up the uh, overall methodology. It's not a number we just picked out of the air. It, 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 it essentially measures import reliance and country concentration and economic vulnerability and establishes a threshold based on a statistical um, uh, a metric uh, on the, of those factors. What, but it inherently is not an indication that materials or minerals that are below the threshold don't have supply chain risk. They do. It's just lower than materials that are higher on the list. Um, our preferred way of thinking about this is as a spectrum of supply chain disruption risk. 
So the materials at the top of the list have the highest risk by our metrics and materials at the bottom of the list, whether they're included on the critical minerals list or not, have lower supply chain disruption risk for the factors that we use to evaluate them. So um, uh, inherent in the notion of making a list is some kind of cutoff. Um, uh, we would prefer to, to look at it differently, but uh, we're tasked with making a list. So we make a list and we have a cutoff. Um, and then I would just point out that um, also as part of the Energy Act, we are required to increase our reporting specifically on critical minerals. So we've started putting enhanced um, statistics in the front matter of the mineral commodity summaries, which come out every year at the end of January, that highlight the primary production and secondary production for critical minerals in the United States, um, what our import reliance is, where most of those imports are coming from, um, who the major producers are globally and what percentages of global production they have. Um, uh, so you have, a, I, I think, a, a, a good summary um, table that people can look at to get a, an idea of the salient statistics for critical minerals that end up going into our analysis uh, for um, mineral criticality. And I think that is my last slide. And so I'll turn it back over to Abby. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions at the end following the creation of that list. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker will be Helena Kazduzian, Senior Technology Manager at the Department of Energy's Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies Office in the Secure and Sustainable Materials Subprogram. In this role, Helena is responsible for the DOE's Critical Materials Institute and the coordination of critical materials research across DOE. Helena is one of the many experts behind the DOE's new critical materials assessment and associated list. Helena earned her PhD from Iowa State University in wind energy science, engineering, and policy, and co-focused her graduate studies on electrical engineering. Very impressive. Thank you for, enjoy for joining us, Helena. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, thanks, sorry about that. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and talk about um, DOE's role in this broader uh, landscape. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on critical materials. Um, and these are really the building blocks of many clean energy technologies. Um, and as such, right, they've been a, a cross cutting priority in, in our department for three administrations back to back, including the current administration. Um, I am going to touch just a little bit about the importance of, of these for our mission, um, and in particular, talk about substitutability, because that's a really important part of our, our methodology. Um, a lot of times, these critical materials are difficult to substitute because they have really unique properties, um, like high energy density. Um, and so, you know, when you look at particular um, examples of this, like neodymium and, and neodymium ion boron magnets, you know, they're enabling a really efficient conversion of energy in, you know, wind turbine generators or electric vehicle traction motors. Um, so, so, you know, you can certainly, you know, use permanent free magnet motors, um, but you might uh, have to use a bigger motor, and that's a, a consideration for the whole drivetrain. You might need more energy storage in your electric vehicle. Now you have more lithium and other critical materials that you're balancing out. Um, you can also reduce your overall capacity to produce power at a wind farm, right? So there, there can be sometimes uh, reduced in performance when you do this. Um, but also, uh, substitutes can really come in the form of disruptive technologies. So I think LEDs are a great example of this. Um, when we first started looking at critical materials, where elements for fluorescent lighting was a big concern. Um, but since then, LEDs have gotten quite cheap. Um, they're currently 50% of the lighting market, um, and uh, they uh, offer actually increased efficiency, right? So um, and it reduces our reliance on those um, elements, uh, rare, uh, rare elements in particular. So. I think it's just important to highlight how these are just, you know, critical, you know, block, building blocks of, of our clean energy technologies. Um, and I'm a technologist, so I get excited about that aspect of it, but we're really here to talk about the methodology, right? Um, so, so DOE um, first established our methodology to assess material criticality based, based uh, on both supply risk and important to energy technologies in 2010. Um, that framework, you know, this, this two dimensions is really based on what was developed by the National Academies based in 2007, um, and that looks at two dimensions as well, right, supply risk and the impact of that supply risk um, or disruption. Um, and so that, you know, kind of framework is really what underpins, I think, 
most assessments across the world. Um, but what changes is, you know, that impact of a supply disrupt disruption or restriction, who cares about it, right? It could be a nation, it could be a company. I've seen companies develop their own list of critical materials. Um, so I think there is some similarity in the general framework of, of these methodologies. Um, but our list, our, our assessment we first did back in 2010 really helped us develop our strategy for research. So that was one of the initial impacts. Um, our current strategic framework is based on five pillars, right? Diversity, diversifying, expanding supply, um, looking at, you know, alternative materials uh, and the system. So element, element substitution all the way up to looking at different systems, um, enhancing material and manufacturing efficiency, right? So can we make better use of these materials, reduce generation of waste? Um, promote circular economy, right, through recycling, reuse, remanufacturing, re so we're extending the lifetime of these materials, helping to partially offset the need for new materials um, off the ground, and then also, uh, you know, cross-cutting functions like the assessment, right, to understand what is critical, developing international standards um, to promote uh, traceability and transparency in our supply chains. Um, this has really spurred a decade of investment um, in the department, so basic and applied uh, research um, to, to address, you know, the scientific and technical challenges that underpin these vulnerabilities, right? So I think it shows the impact of the assessment itself, helping us prioritize our, our research, um, but, you know, the passage of bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act has really supercharged all of our investments, right? So we look at the full uh, innovation pipeline now, so extending from basic science all the way to large demonstration and commercialization. Um, so, so for forwarding uh, to today, right, we've uh, um, updated that assessment several times, 2011, 19, and now again this year. Um, we've actually used a consistent methodology um, as, as we've done this, so we can observe the changes over time, right? Critical materials are dynamic, and it helps us observe those, um, those dynamics. Um, our assessment has a couple uh, unique features. Um, one is uh, it's performed from a global perspective. Um, we are looking, again, at the, the lens of energy in terms of who cares, right? Importance to energy, of course. Um, and we look, we are forward looking because we're thinking about the deployment of the technologies we're developing in the, in the department, right? So our, our um, scenarios for clean energy deployment are, look, are based uh, heavily on the ones that were developed by the Inter International e Energy Agency. Um, but we also bring a unique perspective to that as we look at the material intensity of those technologies, right? A lot of our technologists, um, are in offices that are developing, you know, wind, uh, offshore wind, developing electric vehicle batteries. Um, so we have a, a unique perspective on um, the material intensity levels and the range, right? So we end up with a range of possibilities for deployment in the future based on, you know, trajectory of demand as well as the material intensity. I think this highlights that we do use, you know, a quantitative and qualitative uh, combination of, of methods in our assessment. Um, one of the major outcomes of the assessment is our criticality matrices that show um, material criticality in the short and medium term. Um, similarly to what Steve said, it's a spectrum, right? There's things that we rank as critical that are in red and then near critical um, in yellow uh, and then, you know, non-critical. Um, and this is really the first time, uh, this year is the first time we really used stat our statutory authority to determine a list, right? In the past, we had just produced the, the results and they stood on their own. Um, but with the passage of the Energy Act of 2020, we now have the statutory authority. Um, and it's really consistent with what we've been doing in the past where, you know, it's any non-fuel mineral element, substance or material that has both risk for supply chain disruption and also is imp important for energy, right? Um, I think it's important to, to note that we really interpret energy technology to be clean energy technologies um, in this assessment. And that's really because, you know, the deployment of these clean energy technologies is a really major driver for, for supply risk. Um, it's also important to note that, you know, that statutory authority um, uh, includes a definition for critical materials to be all critical minerals. So anything that's produced on the list that Steve Fortier just mentioned is a critical material by definition. Um, and so our list um, includes two categories, right? The critical materials for energy, and this is really the uh, results of our assessment and pertains very specific to our mission in, in DOE. And then there's the critical minerals as well. And there's definitely some duplication across those two categories. I think that just highlights the importance of energy to the U.S. economy in particular. Um, and then I think, you know, finally, um, 
what's kind of interesting about the list this year, right, we have produced a list, it really was informing the eligibility of the Inflation Reduction Act 48C tax credit um, on processing, refining, and recycling of critical materials. I think this highlights the different purposes of a list versus the assessment itself. Um, you know, we, we made a policy determination to create the list. It's anything that was included um, that was scored as either critical or near critical in both the short and medium term. And this is because we're looking at forward looking scenarios. There is uncertainty. So we erred on the, the side of inclusion um, for the purpose of the tax credit. But forward looking, right, we are really um, excited about the results. You know, we dig into the different materials and we, we think about how we make investments. So we're at a really pivotal point now to, to really narrow in our, our investments and think about um, where the priorities are. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Abby. Thank you so much, Helena, and very interesting drawing some of the early distinctions between the minerals list and the materials list in terms of being uh, forward thinking versus in time, global versus domestic. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, and just a reminder to everyone in our audience to please be posting questions into the Q&A box. With that, I will introduce our final speaker. Uh, our final speaker will be David Pino an economist at the Department of Defense's Defense Logistics Agency and one of the many experts behind the DLA's strategic materials list. In this role, David is responsible for identifying material shortfalls for use in the national defense stockpile. Thank you for joining us, David. Good morning, Abby, and thank you for um, having me here to speak on this important topic. So uh, the DLA strategic materials operates the national defense stockpile. And we've been doing that uh, ever since the creation of the stockpile back in 1938, back uh, in, uh, with the passage of the Strategic, Strategic and Critical Materials Stockpiling Act. Section 12 of that act defines a strategic and critical material as one that would be needed to supply the military, industrial, and essential civilian needs of the economy during a declared national emergency. Now, in broad strokes, a declared national emergency would be a basically a general emergency as declared by the president or by the Congress. Section 14 of that act lists in very general terms the, um, the items uh, which we have to address during the national emergency. And in very broad strokes, it's, it's hostilities against a near peer combined with an attack on the homeland. So our basic mandate is to prevent and preclude a dangerous and costly reliance on foreign supplies of materials during a national emergency. So our job is to ensure that the United States economy has sufficient materials to operate uh, both uh, militarily and to meet the essential civilian needs of the economy during wartime. We've defined essential civilian basis the um, the essential, uh, uh, the essential uh, critical infrastructure as defined by the Department of Homeland Security. So those essential, uh, those uh, critical infrastructure sectors are the ones that we use in order to um, formulate uh, the needs of the economy during and after uh, this national emergency. Now, when we, when we do our modeling for this report that we send to Congress every two years, we have basically we have two lists. One is uh, adheres very closely to uh, Steve's list, the USGS list. There, our list is somewhat longer, mainly due to due to the fact that we um, we model additional forms of materials. Uh, so it, while manganese might be on Steve's list, we might do manganese and ferromanganese. Uh, why niobium might be on Steve's list, we will do niobium and ferro-niobium. So our list is expanded basis of some of the subtypes of materials that we include in our, in our study lists. The second list tend to be defense unique items and engineered materials. So things like carbon fibers, energetics, things that uh, a large percentage of the demand is, based as, uh, is uh, consumed by the Defense Department. So when we, we get that list, currently it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 150 materials. That includes all the subtypes. So every two years, we're required to model um, a, a, um, a war. It's essentially a stress test of the United States economy to see how supply chains would react during a national emergency. And 
at that during in that event we have a surge demand for industrial activity which has a concomitant knock-on effect on the demands for raw materials during that surge demand we have um, at the same time we purposefully uh, in the model, shut down supplies of what we deem to be unreliable suppliers. Um, that would include countries that are uh, obviously the enemy combatant, uh, um, uh, the uh, countries that uh, have poor governance, and countries that would be sympathetic to the enemy. So during this 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 uh, uh, this modeling exercise for this stress test. There's a disequilibrium going. There's a there's a, there's elevated demand for industrial output to meet the needs of the military and to repair and replace things that are lost during the war, at a time when we have decremented supplies uh, of those materials. So, you know, getting back to the the methodologies, you know, as Steve mentioned, um, the the two main variables are high high uh, concentration of production, combined with a high net import reliance. And if the if the import reliance is from a uh, a country with poor governance or a country that is um, dangerous, if you will, uh, that risk goes up. So uh, with those two metrics, you know, we we closely adhere to the USGS list for our for, for that for that first study list, and then the second the second list is, is as I mentioned earlier is, is is mainly defense unique items. So once we once the model uh, spits out a, um, a, a output results, we get a subset of the materials that we model that do present potential shortfalls uh, if the if this national emergency scenario, which we refer to as the base case, were to occur. That shorter list becomes a a uh, what we call a, we send up to Congress as our recommendations for action. So within within that. Uh, longer list of study materials, we may have a subset of 40, 50 materials that would be candidates for risk mitigation action, which would require additional legislative uh, uh, um, uh, authority and funding to to put in the, to put in the stockpile. So, you know, in closing, you know, we we don't the Def Department of Defense doesn't really have a critical minerals list. We have a strategic and critical minerals list that is generated through a very specific data-driven rigorous econometric modeling process to un help inform Congress on, uh, on and recommend to Congress what we believe would be needed by the U United States uh, in, in times of a national emergency. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Abby. Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much to all of our speakers for their amazing presentations in an attempt to level set us on the differences between all of these many lists or even non-lists, as David pointed out. We've been getting a lot of questions from the audience, and so I'll try to get to as many as I can. But before I turn to those, maybe I'll start with a question for all of our speakers. Um, and maybe I'll start with Steve, and we can go in the order that the speakers presented. But I'm curious if you could comment on the coordination between the various agencies in developing these lists. Both Helena and David mentioned that they often refer to the USGS list as either, you know, a, a sublist of their lists or, you know, a baseline. So um, could you please comment on the coordination between the other agencies and any considerations that go into that informing the Department of the Interior's list? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the process that we use and that we lead is an interagency process under the auspices of the Critical Mineral Subcommittee of NSTC in the uh, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. And so this methodology and the list that has been generated from this methodology is very much an interagency exercise. Uh, DOE is a co-chair of that subcommittee. OSTP is a co-chair. USGS is a co-chair. Significant uh, involvement and input from the Department of Commerce, from the Department of Defense. Um, we have representatives from virtually every agency on that subcommittee. So there is communication and collaboration uh, in the development of this and a review process prior to issuing the um, uh, proposed revised list to the Federal Register for the agencies to weigh in with their any concerns they have. So it it is, although USGS led, very much uh, an iterative and collaborative process among the interagency 
Thank you very much, Steve. Actually, with that, I think you did a pretty good job of answering that question. And so maybe I'll turn to a question from the audience since we have a number coming in. Um, let's see here. Uh, Helena, how about we'll turn to you for a question here. Um, the DOE, through a variety of funding vehicles, supports the development of emerging technologies. Is there a requirement for funded projects to reduce reliance on critical minerals, like some European government agencies have, to encourage the use of substitutes or those disruptive technologies that you mentioned? Uh, thanks so much for that question. Um, the, the answer is yes and, right? So, so not all projects have to reduce reliance on critical materials, but certainly that is one of the foundational pillars of our strategic framework. So we do look at the development of, for example, long uh, duration energy storage um, for the grid that can use you know, non-lithium battery technologies and reduce the use of critical materials generally. But we also looked at, at the other, other ways, right, to, to, to address the problem and, and the vulnerability. So again, diversifying supply, looking at circular economy approaches, um, and improving the efficiency of, of the material use and processing and manufacturing. Um, and so this is all part of, um, we have statutory authority now through the Energy Act of 2020 for a critical materials program, again, uh, spanning from research to commercialization, um, and, and the, the subpoints of that are really consistent with our, with our strategic framework. So, um. Thank you very much, Helena. And continuing on that note for substitution, we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience in relation to the re export restrictions on germanium and gallium. And so maybe a question for, I'm not sure who might want to take this, maybe Helena, maybe Steve. Um, did the, Has the DOE, maybe for you, Helena, actually, has the DOE found that silicon can help substitute for gallium and germanium, especially for solar? Is that something that you might be able to address? Yeah, I can uh, address from the perspective of the assessment we just did. Um, for, for gallium and the use of solar, definitely silicon is considered a substitute. It's considered, you know, a good substitute for gallium um, uh, based solar. Um, for germanium, it's primarily used in space uh, solar applications, so we did not consider that within the context of the assessment. Um, I don't know if anyone else can comment on the suitability of silicon for, for space um, uh, applications. I could perhaps uh, add a bit there. Um, certainly for some applications, you can substitute for, for the more, I think, emerging technologies and semiconductors and, and optoelectronics, there seems to be very limited um, ability to substitute. For some of these very specialized um, applications, often I think the conclusion people reach is that you can substitute, but you have to sacrifice something, either performance or price. Um, and if it's performance that is paramount, then then it really uh, limits the the effectiveness of substitution. So, uh, for some things, there are reasons why they are optimal for their application, and and it makes substitution, I think, very difficult. Thank you very much, Stephen. We went a bit into the weeds with some of those questions, so maybe I'll try to scope us back out to the fifty thousand foot view. Um, I was wondering if each of you could potentially comment on what are the benefits of sort of having the multiple critical and materials lists and what might some of the potential drawbacks be? Each of you mentioned sort of the different prisms with which you're looking through the various lenses of the lists. Um, perhaps, David, we might be able to start with you to hear more about the specific prism when it comes to the Department of Defense lists, and then we can go to Helena and to Stephen. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a great question. So. The, the benefit of having multiple lists, is, as you said, is that each agency represented here has their own specific mission requirements. So Helena is, um, and I want to speak for DOE, but you know, based us on her on her comments, it, it, you know her, she's hyper focused on energy transition. Um, Steve's list is you know pure pure science and pure data driven, and our list is is basically to ensure that the United States can can fight and win a war and then repair and replace the infrastructure that is damaged or lost and the frankly the weapons and munitions that have been expended and lost during that fight. So uh, ours is a you know we start with a, a pretty you know if you look at it like a upside down funnel uh, or a coffee cone if you will we start with a really big hopper right and all these materials go in it and then it kind of runs through the hopper and out pops a very, very small list, in our case, of materials that uh, rise to the threshold uh, 
of being deemed strategic and critical for purposes of defense. Um, so I think that's where we we some DLA or the Defense Department somewhat departs from, uh, certainly from DOE and uh, USGS. Thank you, David. Uh, Helena, could you comment as well? I think David uh, captured pretty well, right? That the specific mission space for each agency is really driving the differences in the in the different lists, and I think. The benefit of that actually is it creates a bigger picture, right? You can understand criticality from multiple perspectives. Um, if you look across them, you might be able to understand more particularly about, you know, the role of neodymium, not just for the energy transition, but also for our defense um, capabilities and how it embraces our economy and national security, right? Um, so I think, you know, again, we apply that lens of energy and DOE, but the other less, there's a lot of coordination that goes on, as Steve mentioned. I think on the flip side, it, it just creates some confusion, right? Not everyone lives and frees critical materials and minerals, um, and that's fair. Um, but I think, you know, I'm hoping this discussion helps, um, you know, folks understand how, you know, we assess criticality um, and how it serves our unique missions. Thank you, Helena. And finally, Steve, not everyone lives and breathes critical minerals lists. How crazy is that? I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think each of the agencies clearly has their own um, perspective on this and are responding to specific statutory requirements uh, that, that we are uh, obliged to, to uh, implement. Um, and, and, you know, in many ways, we always say critical minerals are depend on who is asking the question, right? So if you look at the, the list from different countries, they will be looking at it from their own perspective. We look at it from our perspective. Our list is broad and inclusive. Um, and I think there is some advantage in, in approaching this with different methodologies and looking at where the common, commonly uh, accepted uh, um, uh, agreement is on, on what's critical and what's not. And then looking at the outliers and say, well, why is this on one list and not on another? Is there something we're missing here? No methodology is perfect. Um, and, and you're not going to get agreement uh, uh, when, when different uh, groups are looking at this through their different lenses. So um, I know people uh, get confused when they see different lists. Um, that's understandable. But the, the very act of making a list is an attempt to simplify a very complex issue. And so it's not really too surprising to us that, that you get some differences when people look at it through a, a different lens from a different perspective. Thanks so much, Steve. You talked about the differences or also spoke about the many lists that exist in other countries. I was wondering if you might be able to expand and also welcome other panelists to expand on the extent to which we should be coordinating with other countries when it comes to developing our lists. I believe there was an example, Steve, where uh, somebody wanted potash to be on the list, but we get a, a number of our potash comes from Canada, a very close ally and friend. Um, so to what extent should we be factoring that into our uh, creation of these lists? Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at uh, all of the you know, executive orders and the legislation that's come out on this, either implicitly or explicitly, there is a view that you can mitigate supply chain risks through trade with reliable partners. The IRA is the most recent example where free trade agreement countries are included and essentially are considered as domestic content. Um, and, you know, given the difficulty and the timelines required to develop um, domestic resources in the short to intermediate term, that is clearly an effective mechanism of mitigating our, our risks. USGS has done studies in the past looking at import reliance, for example, through the North American lens rather than the U.S. lens. And it, it markedly reduces import reliance and therefore uh, um, supply chain disruption risk. Um, so if we can rely on our, our close trade partners with whom we've had uh, relationships going back decades, it clearly is an advantage for us and gives us uh, an intermediate term uh, response lever to, uh, to mitigate the uh, near and intermediate term risks. Thank you very much, Steve. I also saw, David, that you were nodding your head. Is there anything that you would like to add on to there? Are we working closely with our defense allies to maybe coordinate who's stockpiling what? Um, yeah, to an extent. We, we, we work with the uh, National Technology Industrial Base um, and, uh, and, uh, and, the, um, and uh, the Joint Industrial Base Working Group on some of these issues. But I totally concur with Steve. 
Um, there is some uh, international agreements uh, and discussion like between the United States, United Kingdom and Australia, whereby, you know, critical minerals would be a source from either of those countries would be considered a domestic source for purposes of, of um, you know, strategic and critical materials. Um, of course, Canada is a big trading partner and a, and a very close ally, um, Mexico as well. Um, so, you know, to the extent to the extent practical, I, I think that um, that, you know, uh, doing business with like minded societies is always good business. Um, so, um, you know, I think we should see more of that and I would encourage more of that. Thank you, David. Um, you talked about the fact that sometimes we can refer to allied countries as being a domestic source that might refer in some instances to, you know, our DPA Title III funding, which can be used for feasibility studies for mining and minerals for the things that we need. Um, you know, right now we can, ha we have a list of like national technology and industrial based countries that can maybe be, you know, applied to that DPA Title III funding. Um, in addition to the DPA list, which has a presidential declaration for maybe uh, it calls out a couple more specific minerals. There's also other non-list lists like the IRA Section 45X critical materials list that has been called out on this as well. Um, perhaps a question maybe to start with you, David, how does the, the sort of non-list lists like the DPA Title III presidential determination affect your thinking in evolving the DLA list? Uh only to the extent that it would have a direct impact on defense or essential civilian needs. So in our modeling exercise, defense demands come first. So we're in a wartime footing, the defense department, um, it, you know, our mandate is that the defense department must get the materials it needs in order to fight and win that war. Then comes essential civilian. So in that that part of the mandate, if you will, is is really a, a legacy component of the title of the of Title Fifty, the, the the Strategic and Critical Materials Stockpiling Act, that was signed during World War II, and so you know, you know just before World War II, 1938, and so the 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 notion that um, you know any other kind of lists or non lists would affect our list um, would only I would say only have a tangential effect. And it have to meet those two parameters, um, defense and essential civilian. Thank you, David. And Stephen and Helena, in reference to the IRA 45X long list of critical minerals and materials, how does that influence your thinking or does it at all? Or how does it relate to your materials lists? I'll let Helena go first. Sorry. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, because our list is really based on the methodology that's used to produce it, it doesn't have a direct impact in terms of, of you know, the assumptions that are going into or the scope. Um, there's pretty good agreement. I think if you like cross lists, <laughs> I think 40 uh, or 45 X and, and what's on the USGS list and what's, you know, what we consider in our assessment for DOE, um, I think there's a lot of similarities. And so what, what's the bigger imp, input or like, I guess, impact of those lists in IRA particularly is how we coordinate the implementation of those, right? So um, we have a loan program in office, you know, awarding, processing and refining, uh, you know, uh, uh, projects um, related to battery materials. For example, um, we have the bypass infrastructure law, we're making large investments there. And then there's also, you know, the, the tax credits being deployed through IRA. So it, it ends up being more of a coordination of our implementation and the broader landscape as we're thinking about the development of these, of, uh, you know, pretty much brand new supply chains, right, in the United States. You know, and I guess from from our perspective, um, you know, our our methodology is is data driven and and um, you know based on on measurable factors, um, and so it doesn't really influence what's on our list. Uh, it's, in fact, it's the other way around. I mean, the list is used uh, as, as, a, as a reference point for, for legislation. Um, I think, you know, it is clear that um, for, for most things, uh, certainly the, the uh, materials that were the subject of presidential determinations that rare earths for the perimeter magnet supply chain and, and for advanced battery materials, those are on our list. They're on the DOE's list. They're they're probably on uh, a DOD's list as well. So there's a lot of commonality there, um, and I think we all get to similar answers, with some uh, few exceptions. Um, and in that, 
that is, you know, informing um, the legislation that flows from this rather than the other way around. Thank you very much for clarifying that. With that, let's turn around to a question from the audience. Um, this one is for all of you. Do the USGS, Department of Defense, or Department of Energy factor in domestic reuse and recyclability of certain minerals, lithium, copper, nickel, and cobalt in particular, when determining supply chain vulnerability? If not, is this something they would consider as the advanced energy recycling industry grows domestically? Um, Helena, is that something maybe you want to take first? Sure. Uh, so, so in terms of the actual methodology, I think um, availability uh, is is part of of the rubric, um, and we do look at um, recycled uh, materials as a source if they are, you know, commercial um, or you know going to be um, available. We don't have a firm level, um, you know, uh, assessment, so we're not capturing every single, um, you know. Uh, producer um, that's out there, um, but certainly um, the production, um, not just from primary ore, but from, from unconventional and secondary sources, if they are online, are part of the uh, factors considered. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that one? Recyclability? Sure, I, can, I can comment from USGS perspective. Um, as part of our net import reliance statistics that we report every year, then the denominator of that um, equation has both primary and secondary production um, as part of the calculation. We collect information on secondary production and it's part of our overall domestic supply. So it is embedded in um, the statistics that we use in the, in the model for determining criticality. Thank you. Yeah, very oh, please. Oops. Sorry, Abby. Um, no but finish. Um, yeah, so um, from our perspective, we we uh, we uh, are under a member uh, an agreement with USGS, and they provide us with some of the foundational demand and supply data that we use. And, and as Steve mentioned, uh, recycling recycle materials part of that 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 equation. Um, but from a mitigation point of view, uh, DLA strategic materials does have authority to recycle and um, stockpile uh, certain materials, and we have. We have a program, uh, two programs, in fact, one on uh, recycling germanium from spent tank windows and rifle scopes, <clears throat> excuse me, and another one that recycles um, uh, alloys from spent fan blades of engines. So within the, you know, within the overall broader context of, of bringing stuff into the stockpile to mitigate a supply risk, it's not just buying virgin material where, you know, so we can, you know, we can, we can save um, where we think we can save money, um, and where it makes sense economically, um, uh, we we can have we do have the authority to um, engage in, in these in so, these sort of recycling programs. With that in mind, and thinking of these materials as sort of their their own strategic stockpiles in and of themselves, you know, we think about how in the United States we have less than 0.3 percent of nickel reserves. If you're talking about shoring up the supply chain for electric vehicle batteries, if you once you have the critical capacity of all those vehicles in your car park, is there a way to you know maintain those uh, mineral materials within your borders so that you can continue to recycle them again and again? Which sort of leads to the question when you're talking about a critical mineral and material, whether it's for a stockpile or for a list, how far down the supply chain should we really be looking here? So as for example, for the Department of the Interior list, more focused on, you know, the very far upstream, the elements themselves. Um, David and Helena, you've mentioned some things like carbon fibers. Um, how far down should we really be going in terms of figuring out what should be on these lists? Um, Stephen, would you like to take that one first? And then I'd love to hear from each of you. Sure. I, I think um, we have to look at the whole supply chain. I mean, if you have a vulnerability at any node in the supply chain, it's still a vulnerability, right? So if we have a gap, we have to understand that gap and how to address it. Um, so it has to be a holistic approach from mine to finished product. Um, and this is where the different agencies have different roles. We are focused more on the upper end of the, the supply chain. Um, and whereas DOE might be um, more focused on, on uh, uh, further down the, downstream and, and DOD still further downstream to, to final products. So understanding that whole supply chain is essential um, to eliminate um, uh, vulnerabilities at any node in the supply chain. Thank you. Helena? If I can add to that, so I think 
you know, the current calorie assessment is one measure of vulnerability that we look at in, in DOE. Um, we are still wrestling within the future what the, what the scope of that is. If we include a, a limited set of engineering materials in this particular set of um, assessment, um, we did not include materials that are used in the manufacture or processing of materials, right? So helium is important for the manufacture of, of semiconductors. Um, it's not in the semiconductor, right? So it's not captured in our current assessment. So we're thinking about that broader scope. Um, and I think, you know, we last year we had released um, a set of, of supply chain deep dive assessments um, as part of our American strategy to secure this uh, uh, supply chain for a robust clean energy transition. Um, there's uh, several material focused um, deep dives as well as looking at the technology. So looking at both magnets and wind, right? Looking at semiconductors and the grid. Um, so some of that like more downstream and value chain um, assessments. Uh, we do th those as well. Um, and of course, um, we'll be continuing to looking at, to look at those kind of different vulnerabilities. And so we, again, understand the gaps uh, across the entire supply chain. David, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll um, uh, expand upon both Steve's and Helena's uh, comments. Uh, first in the gap, uh, and I agree with Steve, we need to look at the whole supply chain from mine to finished product. Um, but I'll use an example in, in my experience. So um, as we sit here today, the United States does not manufacture centered neodymium ion boron magnets. So in our previous assessments of, say, neodymium oxide, um, we don't consume a lot of that going into magnets since because we don't manufacture the alloys and the magnets in this country. So we didn't have we a shortfall for neodymium was either zero or or small, and that had people scratching their heads uh, because you know it's a, a lot of the what seventy percent of the neodymium is used to make goes into the, these magnets, and we had to explain well we don't make the magnets, so the model's not picking up the consumption in that end use in this country. Now, if you looked at the magnets that are imported into this country as magnets or the components that contain magnets imported into this country, you'd see a fairly large vulnerability. And that brings up the concept of embedded demand. Very hard to measure, very hard to peel back that onion to get to the materials embedded in, um, in, in semi-finished products and in finished products. So that's one issue. And the other issue is, as Helena touched on an extremely important point, the, the assessments that we do in the lists that we make seem to suggest that the materials are used in isolation. They're not, right? They're used in combinations, right? They're used with other materials. They require other materials to make the materials themselves and the other materials are brought in to make the finished product. That, doing that, modeling that would ex ex explode the complexity of this problem, right? And so, but Elena touched on a good point. It's something that needs to be done in order to capture all the risk. Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, a webinar on critical minerals lists would not be complete without a question on copper, which seems to be an incredibly hot topic today. Noted that it is not on the critical min minerals list for the Department of the Interior, but it is on the critical materials list for the Department of Energy. So we have a question from the audience asking whether you can elaborate regarding the threshold criteria as to why copper, although heavily used by the DOD as well, in addition to energy and other national security things, is not considered critical on the Department of the Interior critical minerals list. Um, should that criteria be readjusted? So Steve, maybe we'll turn to you first to talk about copper on the minerals list, and then Helena, maybe to you for materials, sure. if you want to chime in as well. This is not the first question we've had about copper on the critical minerals <laughs> list, I can assure you. Um, you know, we we understand completely that, that copper is essential. It is below the threshold uh, for our methodology for inclusion on the list. It is trending toward critical, clearly, over the past 10 or 15 years. You can see that in our data. But our model at this stage is not forward-looking. We're not for, uh, factoring in demand forecasts. And, and frankly, the demand forecasts are all over the place. Um, but we are tasked with developing that forward-looking capability, and we are working on that. Um, we absolutely believe that copper is essential. 
if the stated policy objectives of various governments come to fruition, then there could well be a shortage in the future. But I would note that from an analytical point of view, and we are a science agency after all, um, the DOE assessment using a different methodology and ours essentially came to the same conclusion that copper is not currently critical and that it is trending toward critical in the intermediate term. So I think from an analytical point of view, uh, you know, what we've said is, is correct. Um, whether we should in some way uh, better capture the forward demand is, is something that we're working on and, and, and that we will revisit in the next cycle. Thank you, Stephen. Melina. Yeah, and if I can just expand on that too, when you look at the results of the DOE, you know, critical materials assessment, you find in the short term that copper was found to be not critical, and then in the medium term, it was found to be near critical. Um, so again, I think it's consistent with what you said, it's trending towards criticality. We did draw the line, uh, right, for you know, to be inclusive of near, crit near critical, um, both the short and medium term, um, to be inclusive because of the uncertainty with, with looking forward. Um, but we do recognize it is a big, uh, big part of our, like, electrifying everything, right? You're going to need copper. If you don't want to use magnets, you're going to use even more copper in your electric vehicle traction motor, right? Same thing with wind turbines. So, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, importance doesn't necessarily always equal criticality. Um, it's a primary metal, right? Um, so that, that's another factor as well, but um, certainly something that we want to keep our eye on um, in the future and see how the trends evolve. And David, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, it, it, we, we model copper uh, in our in our in our process. Um, so it's on it's on our study list. Um, and uh, but it, it wasn't in shortfall in our last uh, run of the model and for the FY 23 rec uh, report to Congress. Um, and that's because we, we mine it domestically, which is a good thing. And our imports come basically from friendly countries. So it, it doesn't check either box it, as we define as we define the criticality for our purposes. So that's why it wouldn't. It, it, it's not surprising that it uh, didn't show up in shortfall. I will note that copper has several important byproducts, um, particularly molybdenum, and then from uh, molybdenum, um, rhenium. Um, so um, it's important to to understand that supply chain. And as an economist, um, uh, copper is a leading indicator, uh, or some view it that way. And it's, it's ubiquitous in society. It's used in everything, uh, and so it, it you know as and some economists believe that you know it's it's one leading indicator of overall e economic growth and economic uh, dynamics. So it, it's while it's not critical per our definitions, specifically referring to the USGS list, um, it is trending that way, and it, it's still an important element in the, in our society. Thank you, David. And with that, I think we have time for maybe one final question for closing thoughts out from our panelists. And I'm curious to hear from each of them, what are the next steps for your lists and how are your agency's actions really being influenced by your lists as they currently stand? And so maybe we'll start off with you, Stephen, go to Helena and then finish with David for our final thoughts. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Abby. Um... We are sort of in the middle of the next cycle for reviewing and, and potentially revising the list. Um, and so we anticipate that um, there will be something coming out in, in 2024, or early 2025 um, uh, on, that, on that score. Within the USGS, um, we are using the list and the criticality assessment that we generate to help prioritize other investments that we are making under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, to um, map uh, and do geophysical surveys of uh, the uh, United States. So it provides a framework for us for uh, focusing our activities and our investments to improve our understanding of the domestic resources in the United States. It's been quite uh, quite useful in that way. But that's uh, that's really our focus at the moment. For you, it's very similar, right? We we now have a sense of kind of the spectrum, like Steve mentioned, of, of criticality for energy uh, brought into the present day um, and looking at the future. And so that can help guide our investments. Um, we have currently over $8 billion from the bipartisan infrastructure law related to critical minerals and materials, right? So we want to think about how that affects uh, implementation of those to the extent we have um, any flexibility. And then we do have a cross-cut uh, program every year. We're directed to spend, uh, you know, several uh, hundred million dollars on critical materials research. Um, and this will help us think about what are the fundamental issues 
that in, and form long-term challenges as well as you know near-term um, you know technology challenges as well. Thank you, Helena. It sounds like your dog is also very excited about critical minerals lists. <laughs> and David, please, final thoughts on the evolution. What are the next steps for the DLA and their list? Yeah, uh, well, we'll continue to uh, work very closely with the excellent work done uh, by Steve's group. Um, of course, we're, we work closely with DOE um, uh, and um, we'll continue to read their reports and monitor their, their program. Um, but for our modeling purposes for the next uh, iteration of the report to Congress, we're going to try to get a better sense on these interrelationships between these materials, try to see what the impact downstream in the economy would be if there were a supply disruption of a material. So what sectors of the economy would would um, not suffer, but would, would be compromised or maybe have a slowdown or a, 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 a experience a bottleneck uh, in, a, due to, a, due to a, um, a disruption in the supply chain for raw materials. So those modeling efforts are underway. Um, and so we hope to have some, some um, new information on that and on the next uh, requirements report, which is due in um, January of uh, 2025. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of our speakers again for joining for our webinar today. And there you have it, folks, the beginnings of trying to untangle all the differences between these lists and many others. Thank you for joining, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for having me.